I'm Stephen Foskett. I'm Frederick Van Heren. And this is the Utilizing AI Podcast. Welcome to Utilizing AI, the podcast about enterprise applications for machine learning, deep learning, and other artificial intelligence topics. So over the last few months, and, and actually the last years of this podcast, we've talked quite a lot about AI ops, which is the use of AI to support uh, enterprise operations in IT. We've also talked a lot about ML ops, which is essentially using machine learning to uh, basically improving the, the structure around machine learning. Uh, Frederick, uh, I think that it can be a little confusing, these two terms, and I think that some people, especially on the IT side of things, don't really understand what MLOps is. Right. A, a lot of work goes into building models, and, and the real challenge is to go from prototyping and experimenting to production in a structure fashion. And so MLOps is really a, a mechanism to help provide repeatable and a structured way to build models, which is really key, right? It's, it doesn't make a lot of sense if you can build a model, but you don't have the ability to rebuild that model over and over and over at will. And so I think today would be good to hear from ZenML and how this can be done in a repeatable and a controlled manner. And luckily they actually use open source. So I would really be interested to hear more about their framework. Absolutely. And uh, so as uh, Frederick mentioned, we're joined here uh, from ZenML. Uh, by Adam Probst. Adam, uh, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself a little bit, and then we'll dive in and talk a little bit more about MLOps. Yes, for sure. Hi, Stephen. Hi, Frederick. I'm Adam. I'm a co-creator of, of ZenML, and we were facing exactly these problems in our earlier startup. So we, we were using predictive maintenance to, um, for, for vehicle and maintenance optimization in big commercial vehicle fleets, and then figured out that the way bigger problem what we were solving was not the um, the trucks uh, preventing from breaking down, but to bring this machine learning model what we built into production. And that's not that's what we not just did for one or two times, but for a hundred times. And this is when we when we saw that this is a way bigger thing out there what needs to be solved and not just for predictive maintenance, but so many other AI use cases. And this is how we were diving into MLOps. Yeah, it does seem like uh... Well, there's almost a stigma attached to machine learning and data science that it's uh, sort of a, an, a game for academics or, uh, I don't know, a, 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 an experiment, not a real production uh, application for business. And my understanding is that you sort of went through that learning process as well, and you realized that, that making this part of the business, making this a real application to do uh, real work was the real work that needed to be done, is that right? Yes, exactly, definitely. So we were, um, first of all, you have to understand how the ho whole MLOps world is functioning, what roles are participating, what are the titles, so that it's really fragmented and just forming right now. So you have several types of people, they are called, we can talk about that in depth right now, um, depending on where you wanna dive in, but. You have ML engineers, you have data scientists, you have data engineers, you have uh, the, the ops guy, and you have researchers some, somehow included. And right now, the whole, the whole industry is moving into the direction of putting then in, that into a production um, scenario, like you can compare it to a factory. But this is not how data science should get into production, because you have different, way different characteristics in data science than, than in a normal uh, like waterfall production scenario like we used to have it in software engineering. Yeah, so when we, we, when we talk a little bit about MLOps, you know, we always talk about pipelines and, and like, like you mentioned, there are different roles during, during each stage of the pipeline. So how do you integrate all these different roles in the different stages of a pipeline? I mean, all pipelines are not equal, right? So there, there are simple pipelines and a lot more complex pipelines, but how do you kind of correlate the roles with the, the, the framework, so to speak, you're presenting? Mm -hmm. So for that, we need to understand what roles are, are in there. So let's start, for example, with the data engineer. The data engineer is um, somebody who's taking care of the data, is filling, is filling some nulls, 
um, shaping it up for the next station. And then, as 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 I all as I say, station, you have to hand it over to at some point to a next person, and that would then be the ML researcher or also somehow data science called data scientist. So it's but, but just just for for you to um, see the whole process and the steps in between. So the data engineer is giving it to the ML researcher. The ML researcher is then um, using, well, different tools, PyTorch, TensorFlow to train the model. And then again, there is a station giving it, giving it over to either an ML engineer, which is in between. Sometimes it depends on the companies, how they are set up, or directly to a, an ops guy who is bringing it into production um, on Kubernetes or wherever. So you have different stages, you have different um, well phases of ownership for, for the um, machine learning pipeline. And then in the end, you hopefully have it in production. But if it then breaks, nobody knows who, who is owning the whole thing. So um, this is why it's very, very hard to set it up like a production line in a factory, like I just imagined it. But it's another layer on top because data science, so many things are changing in between. The, the, the data is changing constantly, then you can't walk through the same process. The, um, the accuracy or the models, are, the results of the models are changing. So you have to have a, a loop back. And sometimes the loop is going to the very beginning. Sometimes the loop is just going one step before and, and re redoing the last step. So it's, it's a very fragile um, uh, yeah, setting and you can't compare it to a production -like, line like Henry Ford was, was invent in inventing it. So, um, but, but this is exactly where we would like to um, get the data scientist in the center and give him, him or her full ownership over the whole production line. And we don't name it production line anymore, we name, name it machine learning pipeline. Um, but let's dive, let's dive into that. Uh, I'm, I'm super curious where, where uh, you want to bring that, Frederick. Right. I, I think, you know, in, in the AI world, a lot of things are changing, right? The frameworks are changing. The tools are changing. The hardware is getting faster and faster. There's specialized hardware. Um, and so there's a continuous change. So, so I, would, I would even say that it's extremely difficult to keep up with all the changes, right? And certainly MLOps, uh, when you read a little bit about MLOps, you will see that there are, um, there are more recent views on MLOps with newer tools. How do, you, how do you integrate that all into the framework? How do you keep the framework moving with all the changes? Maybe that's a, a better way to frame it. Yes, that's very interesting. So um, in software engineering, everything is about technical debt, right? So um, machine learning in particular is um, so-called, I, I, uh, I, I read a quote, which says machine learning is the high interest credit card of technical debt. So it's, it's even exaggerating um, the, the normal technical debt problem. And um, another quote what I would like to bring in is um, as, as we are bringing together the whole fragmented space of, of machine learning, and as you said, um, models are changing, tools are popping out every week, which, which are really great but somehow focusing only one vertical or one step in the machine learning pipeline. And um, it's very interesting to, to bring these together in another layer of abstraction. And this is where we think um, machine learning pipelines should be owned, like on another abstraction layer. And you don't need to know every detailed step. So you don't need to use Kubernetes or you don't need to really in detail know what, what feature stores are doing. Um, it's, it's, it's like a pilot who doesn't know how the, the plane was built or the runway was built or the airport was built, but they are using it and own the whole process because they are the captain or the pilot on the plane. So that's very similar to how we see the data scientists. They are using the infrastructure which, which is already there and in, but on a different ab abstraction layer. So, um, that's how we bring that together. Right, I mean, it, it's a, a question we get a lot when we talk to uh, organizations that don't have anything from an AI perspective, but they, they wanna get started. It's it, the fact that everything changes all the time is, is overwhelming, right? Because they feel that by the time 
they get started uh, on, on AI and they have finished all their meetings, you know, they, they feel like the world has moved on and that they, they're working on the past. So when you, when you talk to customers, how do you, how do you help them get started, right? What is, the, what is the best way for an AI, for a new company that wants to do AI, has a great ID around AI, and maybe has some data engineers and so on, but how do you get started, right? Because a lot of people just don't know how to get started. Yes, definitely. That's, that's a big problem. And some, sometimes they are just blocked by their own legacy. And this is also a fear what, what we would like to take away that because, as you mentioned, we are an open source tool and we are integrating into, into existing systems, we are also integrating to your legacy. If you are forced by your corporate IT department that you have to use a cloud provider, AWS or GCP or whatever, um, or you are forced to, to use some other uh, tools which are already out there, we could integrate them and bring them to a, into a common framework where you can start using them right away. Um, so you don't need to change or rewrite your whole code. You can still use your old tools, but uh, you have the possibility to scale and to, for example, also um, you did everything locally and with a flip of a switch, you can then um, deploy it on a cloud. And this is very interesting for, for users and customers um, as they are very often blocked by, by existing solutions in their legacy systems. Yeah, I think one of the weaknesses of MLOps is, is not, it's not something you can buy, right? You can buy hardware, you can buy tools, uh, but processes like MLOps, you know, you can't, you can't really buy that. It, was that one of the ideas behind ZenML is, is really to kind of guide users through the whole MLOps process? I mean, it's, you can read books about it, but it's it's like anything else. You need some experience. You need to have made some failures in the past because you learn more from failures than from successes. Um, is is that kind of what where you you kind of help the most? Is on the MLOps part, or where would you say, you know, you you what what you bring to the table with the framework? Yes, exactly. So the problems what we were facing was that we were using many tools which were out there. But the glue code, the artifact tracking, the metadata the data tracking in between was done manually or we had to do some, make some glue code. And that was the big challenge for us because it was super manual. It was uh, not very, you, you couldn't very automate it quite well because um, every tool uh, is, has different outputs and what the other input tool would need um, or the other tool as input would need. So we have, this were exactly the challenges what we had before. And this is why we, um, we were abstracting with, with ZenML. We were, I, I don't want to promote, by the way, ZenML too much right now, because I'm, I'm really hoping to, uh, to uh, dive into the problems and, and share our understanding of, of how we were thinking uh, and what problems we had. So this is why we thought we would need something on a higher level, which will take these problems apart and, and solve them individually. And you mentioned one, one problem in the beginning, uh, the reproducibility. So if you, if you cannot reproduce an experiment, you cannot improve it because if the data is changing or whatever is changing, hyperparameters, you don't know whether you performed now better or whether it was just luck. And, and this, this Controlled process was something what we definitely needed for our predictive maintenance models, for example. And in the future, it will be super interesting for corporates or for bigger companies who are forced by law to do some audits. So we enable by by nature already from from the get go, we are enabling this auditability that you can go back in time and see why how your algorithm or your model were fed, by which data, by which, which uh, hyperparameters. You have maybe a YAML file, which is um, writing down all, all the relevant uh, um, yeah, characteristics of the experiment. And then you can go back in time and see by when drifted your uh, model away and who, who, who is guilty right now and uh, how can you improve the process in the future. 
Right. I mean, I think there's a there's a couple of things that is important. I think the 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 fact that you can repeat and create kind of a baseline to improve. I think the second one what I what I hear a lot is is people that have relative success experimenting and prototyping but fail on the production side, right? Bringing a model from from prototype to production is is a lot more difficult. Uh, than what people expect. When you when you talk about your framework, does your framework then go full cycle, experimenting, prototyping to production, and then feeding data back? Is it like a full full circle process? Yes, definitely. Um, it's not an end to end platform because these are these tend to be very opinionated. What we name ourselves is a framework, an MLOps framework, but also from um, from data sourcing till deployment. And um, so this is exactly where we see ourselves. And uh, yes, we are covering the whole process. Yeah, it seems like you're bringing a level of maturity to ML ops that sometimes we don't even see in DevOps. I mean, it, 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 it does seem analogous to DevOps, but it seems like what you're talking about really is uh, more uh, mature, I guess is the right word for it, uh, business processes. Um, do you see yourselves in some ways, um, I don't want to say in competition, but uh, competing for mind share with the DevOps trend, uh, with IT ops and application development all focused on that and that getting a lot of the press? Um, I would say we learn from them. So what, what DevOps was 20 years ago or how it developed over the last 20 years is now what will happen to MLOps. So uh, back then, like tools like Terraform or whatever, it was super fragmented and tools were able to bring everything what is needed together quite well um, and accessible for everyone. And this is what we imagine to do with ZenML to have um, really an, this abstraction layer who everyone can understand, like a data scientist in particular. And with, with, with that, you are also able to dive into the DevOps world uh, so we don't see them as, as com competition at all. We would like to integrate and give the data scientists the possibility not to, now to use um, Kubernetes, for example, uh, with their current skill set. So that's why everything is connected and hopefully uh, will we'll benefit from each other. Another area I think that I see MLOps being sort of uh, trapped between a rock and a hard place is that in many ways, data scientists and um, you know people trying to roll out uh, ML models are stuck between operations and the lines of business at, at a company. So you have the demands, as you mentioned, for example, uh, you know mobility uh, company or a utility or you know whatever you are, whatever the business really is, uh, making demands on the machine learning model, and then you also have IT operations trying to translate that into production. And in many ways, I feel like MLOps gets stuck in the middle and has to translate between these two people who frankly really don't understand each other. Uh, do you experience that? And how does uh, having a mature framework help to alleviate that problem? Yes, definitely we can see that problem. So um, the, what, what, what we saw that is the data scientists wanted to bring their machine learning models into production and gave it over to the, the ops team. And the ops team was then not able to translate everything what was done in, in from the data scientist who has a bit domain no, knowledge and, and re, knows the business case a bit better. They, the, data, uh, the, the ops guys were not really able to translate that into code, every, every detail. So they had to make it production ready, which is a loss of information or a loss, a loss of uh, quality of the model in the end. It, just a simple fact, if they need to transfer it from Python to C++, for example, you, you, you cannot translate every creativity what the data scientist had when they were having the business case in mind into the production scenario. And this was super, super frustrating for, for the data scientist who is basically would like to own the whole, um, the whole, whole pipeline because they created it in its core in, in the experimenting phase. So, um, this is this is how how we how we saw the pro the problems coming up um, until now, and that they don't understand each other and don't speak the same language, and this is why we saw some some potential for another tool out there, uh, which which is trying to 
um, to bring them to the same level. Yeah, so with, with, with the framework, you kind of create an abstraction layer where, where one person can have a complete overview of the pipeline without really having to understand all the different components. And I presume that it's also a lot easier than to pick pieces of the pipeline and you can optimize uh, portions of, of the pipeline as you go. Was that, was that part of the strategy too? I, I guess with, 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 with the AI market moving so fast that you want to be able to switch out you know, Docker or, or Docker Compose with Kubernetes or whatever comes after, I presume, right? Is, is, is the framework as, as, how should I say, as modular as, as it looks? Yes, uh, that was very important from the beginning, from the development, uh, that we can, we are just a bit opinionated if you have, that you have a default. You can fall back if you don't care how it's going to deploy it. We, we can decide for you what deployment tool we're going to use. But if you want to swap out and get in your infrastructure, that's, that's completely possible. And um, in, in these terms, what, why data science is so different is you learn on the go as well. And you learn, if you run through every model, um, the results will be fed back and you learn again. For a, for a, a traditional um, DevOps scenario, it was like you, you put in more power, you, put it, you make the roles more uh, narrow and um, the, the gain what you will have is a higher productivity. The productivity is not so important for like this output productivity for machine learning pipelines because the the ultimate goal is to have a, a better model and this is something what you only can find out if you are experimenting a little bit and not just in the experimenting phase but also in the deployment phase in the conversion phase to, towards production so this is why you need somebody and we think it's a data scientist who can step back and um, can interact with every part of the machine learning pipeline. And just with that overview, they cannot um, optimize just hyperparameters in the, in the training phase, but they can optimize the, the, the um, orchestra of um, all, the, all the pipeline steps which are, which are playing together. So and this is the big difference from traditional product um, software engineering, where everything has to uh, be more productive to Hey, we have a new um, a new kind of uh, research part, which we now can um, we have a better output of of better experiments. So uh, this this is just the, the the difference of how we see it, and this is why we would like to set some somebody in the position of having a big overview over the whole process. It's it's an interesting approach. I, I do like it a lot, and. Uh, it's also important to notice that you provide this as open source. So you, can you talk a little bit about that? You know, why open source? Why not closed closed loop source and so on? <laughs> sure. So um, the analogy to, to DevOps from 20 years ago is also on the business model. I would say, or we think that what SaaS was 10, 15 years ago um, will be open source from now on or in the future. Open source itself is not a business model. It's more um, a mindset or a funnel, let's say, to, to um, you get a lot of credibility because everyone knows your code. You, you have more trust because, um, again, everyone can see your code and can, can um, tune it a little bit and change it. But the outreach is way better than that people are yeah, trust these models way better or the, the whole uh, uh, yeah, framework, let's say SNML right now. And um, with that, we will for sure have another business model behind which will um, sustain us financially. But the idea of creating an open source framework is to reach way more people. And we also know that 99% of our users won't ever pay for our product, but that's fine. Um, other companies have, have shown it, like other open source companies, that you have to change the world and then you can monetize it just on a fraction of, of the world. And this is, this is exactly what we imagine 
and we also think that open source is is a really fair and innovative uh, way of collaborating with the community yeah i think that's that's important i mean if you get if you can get a lot of feedback from your own users you know it kind of fits the ai principle right you use the data from your own users to improve your own product so so that's exactly. that's kind of a, a nice analogy but do you expect then the the development to continue through the community or do you expect to do the development yourself with the help of the community there are two extremes uh, the one is that you develop what is expected from you like you have for example if you have big customers um, but you're still uh, developing open source you you will get driven into one direction which you might tailor towards that one customer but not for everyone on the other side, if you're completely listening to the community, it might be very noisy. Um, so many requests will be coming in. So what we will try to find, or are currently are as well doing, which you can see um, in our GitHub repository with our, uh, our roadmap, is um, a mix, but a bit more towards the community. So we would, we don't care about the monetization and the the, the corporates right now but everyone who is in the community is somehow affiliated anyhow with the corporate because how many hobby projects have you done uh, to bring, uh, when, you, when you were bringing uh, machine learning into production? So in the end, everyone is also associated with the company uh, with big data in the background. So, um, but that's, that's our part of, of our business model or outreach. Yeah, it does take some care when you're developing uh, open source projects like that, because of course, uh, if you listen to the users, like you said, you may get a vocal minority that wants to take something in one direction, uh, whereas you may see uh, maybe a bigger picture um, use case that is more focused in this direction. Of course, you also have to be careful because you don't want to not listen to the open source users and go in that direction when they really need you to go there. So you. I, do, I think it does take a, a very strong uh, leader uh, and strong leadership on the part of the company in order to focus an open source project and incorporate the lessons of the users without uh, avoiding them. Um, I was curious to ask you, uh, within the companies that are using uh, ZenML-based uh, solution, uh, who's driving it? Is it IT operations? Is it data science and machine learning? Or is it the lines of business um, at this point? Uh, that's very interesting. So um, currently, um, many companies are still in the research phase, and the the business case behind is not so um, defined yet. So they are they, um, well, the majority. Some of them are are really bringing it in production and earning money with it. But um, what we saw so far is that the main drivers are either the machine learning engineers or the there are sometimes also MLOps teams out there, and um, normally you would you would think that a data uh, a, de a DevOps engineer will uh, be be the one who is uh, helped the most because they now don't have to bring the uh, the machine learning into production from whatever was thrown over the fence from the data scientist, but now they can relax and just plug in their infrastructure in the framework and, and chill. But um, these guys are super happy, but they are not the drivers. So the drivers are really the data scientists or the machine learning engineers who are now motivated to bring their use case as close as possible to their experiment into the production scenario. So they don't have any um, loss of information until they, they really bring it into production. Because there is no data and uh, no um, DevOps engineer who is who is uh, uh, shredding the code uh, just to make it production ready, and th these are the mo these are the drivers. And most of the time, they are also the um, the data scientists are also the ones who have the business case in mind, like the the, the product owners or whoever, um, because they know the domain. They have a PhD in physics and know way better uh, what you can do with it than a than an engineer who is just bringing it into production. So uh, this is why we are also bringing the, the data scientist in the center and make him fully the owner of the whole machine learning pipeline. And this is why they are super happy with it um, that because they, 
yeah, they get translated into production as best as possible. Yeah, we talked a little bit about MLOps and that things are changing. I mean, for you personally, where do you think MLOps should improve moving forward? Um, so what we can see right now, it's a very, very noisy field. Like tools are popping up every week and which is good because the best tools will, will win, but there won't be one winner. So if, if you see a, a AWS SageMaker or a, a big player in, in the game, uh, maybe by, by a cloud provider, they, it, it is not a market, the winner takes it all. Um, but it will, it doesn't matter whether it's fragmenting more or consolidating more, we can see both directions already that for example, um, Feast was bought by Tekton. It's, it's a data, it's, it's a um, feature store. Uh, the one is open source, the one is closed source. So they are consolidating on the side. On the other side, tools are popping up. They are fragmenting more. But what is always needed is a tool which is bringing them together to avoid the glue code, like a framework, um, like SAMSNML. And this is why no matter how this whole landscape will change, uh, there will be a, the need for uh, for our tool or similar tools. We 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 don't claim to be the uh, the the best, even though we are. <laughs> no, but um, th this is this is the idea behind uh, that the MLOps market is super super uh, vivid right now. Yeah, and and I think it's it's great to hear the uh, the kind of approach that you've got with. Uh you know, looking at the community, looking at open source, not worrying so much about monetization, you know, hoping that you can uh, build the best tool for the job and then that the job will adopt the tool uh, down the road. And um, also, I love the fact that you both come from a very practical background of trying to actually develop an ML application, not just coming to it sort of um, hoping to build a tool for people, you know, abstract people, you're, you're kind of building something for yourselves in a way which I really, really appreciate. So, well, thank you so much for this discussion. It's really been interesting. Um, but uh, the time has come for us to transition into uh, stage two of the uh, Utilizing AI podcast. Uh, as you have been warned, uh, every episode we ask our guests three questions. Uh, this tradition started last season. And um, note to listeners, uh, our guest has not been prepped on these questions ahead of time. So this is going to be really off the cuff and hopefully a little bit of fun. Uh, this season, we're also changing things up. Um, I'm gonna ask a question as is Frederick, but we're also gonna have a question from a special guest. So uh, to start things off, Frederick, do you wanna ask yours first? Sure. So is MLOps a lasting trend or just a step on the way for ML and DevOps to become normal? Very nice question. So um, MLOps will be needed as DevOps is needed since 20 years. So it, it's gonna be the under, underlying um, uh, necessity for every machine learning development because otherwise it doesn't scale. Thank you for that. Uh, my question, uh, and again, this is one of those that we've asked a few times, um, how big do you see ML models getting? Uh, today we have a hundred billion parameter model is that going to look small in the future, or have we reached some kind of limit? Also, a nice question. No, I. It it will, it will explode. It, it will keep on exploding. Like just check out the uh, the GPT um, development from one, two to three. It's the four will be a magnitude higher, and just the data what was collected last two years is more than uh, in history. So this is why. Um, it will keep on and it, the, everything has to keep up as well as the MLOps. <laughs> well, thanks for that. I think that that's what we've heard a couple of times here uh, and not just from the companies making the chips, I might add. Uh, finally, as promised, uh, we're gonna have a question from uh, outside the podcast here. Uh, we actually are bringing in uh, the editor for Gestalt IT, uh, Zach DeMeyer with a question. Hi, Utilizing AI. I'm Zach Meyer, writer here at Gestalt IT, and I have a question for you. What's the most innovative use of AI you've seen in the real world? Currently, I think it's autonomous driving. So uh, the models which are um, continuously in production and uh, shadowing themselves in cars and, and swapped out 
So uh, it's incredible what, for example, um, uh, Andre Carpathy is doing from, he was doing that in research and now is doing it in real life. So this is, I think, the most impressive um, use of AI currently because it's a ton, ton of data, thousands, ten thousands of cars are sending high quality videos um, to, to the cloud and they are continuously training four or five models in parallel. And that's, that's just needs to scale. And this is what's impressive and also inspired us for, for a framework doing similar things, but on a, on a different scale. I'm glad that you were able to uh, come up with something on the cuff here on the fly. Uh, we look forward also to hear what question you might have for a future guest. So afterwards, we'll uh, record one if you have one. And if you, the listener, want to join this, you can. Just send us an email at host at utilizingai.com, and we'll record your question for a future guest. So Adam, uh, thank you for joining us today. Where can people connect with you and follow your thoughts on enterprise AI applications and other topics? Sure. Um, so we would love to create a big Slack community. So uh, please join our Slack channel. You can find everything, also the invitation link on our GitHub repo. It's zenml um, yeah, and, uh, dash io slash zenml on GitHub. And please find me on LinkedIn, connect with me, and we are super happy to, to get in touch and build that framework together. Great. And we'll include that link in the show notes so folks can just click right on through. How about you, Frederick? What's going on in your life? Well, I'm still doing consulting and services in the HPC and AI market, but currently I'm working on a design for a large scale GPU cluster for a customer. So that's keeping me busy. Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn and, and on Twitter as Frederick V. Heron. Excellent. And as for me, uh, you can find me on most social media networks at S. Foskett. Uh, I will point out that this week is our Cloud Field Day event. So if you go to techfieldday.com, you'll be able to see a little bit of me talking to some of the leading companies that are deploying cloud technologies in the enterprise. So thank you for listening to the Utilizing AI podcast. If you enjoyed this discussion, please do subscribe in your favorite podcast application. You can also find us on YouTube. Uh, you can uh, review the show on iTunes as well. Uh, that does really help. And please do share the show in your uh, favorite MLOps community uh, with, or with your friends. This podcast is brought to you by gestaltit.com, your home for IT coverage from across the enterprise. But for show notes and more episodes, you can go to utilizing-ai.com, or you can find us on Twitter at utilizing underscore AI. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week.